Um, hi, everyone. My name is Aubrey Church, and I'm the policy manager at the Cape Cod Commercial Fishermen's Alliance. So to kind of get us oriented, I wanted to provide a map. So in the red star is Mass Maritime, and the black point is Cape Cod Commercial Fishermen's Alliance located in Chatham, Mass. And as you can see, we're really positioned very nicely where we have rich ecosystems that support our fisheries, such as the Gulf of Maine, George's Bank, Nantucket Shoals, and the Southern New England Continental Shelf. The Cape Cod Commercial Fishermen's Alliance was founded in 1991, and so for over 30 years, we've worked with fishermen, community members, public officials, working together to build creative strategies and advocate for our ecosystems and improve marine policies, work towards protecting our ocean ecosystems, and ensuring the viability and future of Cape Cod's fisheries. Engaging with our community and are working collaboratively with many of our partners has been at the forefront of our mission programs, such as training the next generation of young fishermen, providing local seafood to those in need in our communities, as well as engaging our community to meet scientists and fishermen in our region. We have a Small Boats Big Science series, and this brings together community, scientists, and commercial fishermen to discuss some of the recent scientific advancements. So this is a great avenue for community members to get involved, to get to meet scientists, as well as fishermen in the region. Recently, we had Glenn Gorkowitz from Hui, he's a physical oceanographer, talk about the changes to Cape Cod and how that could impact fisheries. This series is also recorded, so if you're ever not able to attend but are interested, you can check it out on our website. We also have Meet the Fleet. This is awesome. <laughs> so this thing works with local chefs on Cape Cod as well as commercial fishermen for an informative presentation as well as a tasting of local seafood. So in February, we had Chef Tyler Hadfield from The Rail. And then just last week, we had Chef Jeremiah Reardon of Red River Barbecue, as well as Captain Jesse Rose from the Midnight Hour and Chatham Light Mussels. And we did a dish on mussels with smoked Texas sausage. So it's a really fun, informal event, but it's an avenue for the community to ask questions of the fishermen. How do you harvest the species? As well as ask the chef, how can I prepare this at home? And how can I find this at my local market? We also do a lot of economic development and training our next generation. We invest in fisheries to provide opportunities for today's fishermen as well as future generations. For several years, the Fishermen's Alliance advocated on the federal level for the Young Fishermen's Development Act. So we had sent fishermen and staff down to Washington, D.C. to lobby and work towards passing the Fishermen's Development Act that was passed in 2021. Largely due to community support, we now offer free trainings for those interested in becoming young fishermen. We developed a comprehensive training program and we've shared that report with other communities around the country so that they can also start their own program. And last year, we worked on training over a dozen Cape Tech students. We also have a Small Boats Big Taste program, and this was launched in 2020 as a response to both fishing and food security challenges that were intensified during the COVID-19 pandemic. So the program was designed with two goals in mind. First, keep small, young, uh, small independent small boat fishermen on the water, but also help address the growing need in our community for a delicious, local, nutritious food. And so we created the Haddock Chowder. In 2022, Small Boats Big Taste provided 950,000 excuse me, in economic impact to our fishermen, the supply chain, and donated product. The success of the haddock chowder led to the production of the Provençal fish stew. And so this is a tomato-based dairy-free stew made with local skates. So as we heard earlier, guys fish for it. It's delicious. It tastes like chicken. So if you don't like fish, you should try this. It's really good, I swear. <laughs> Um, and since the summer of 2020, our Small Boats Big Taste program has provided nearly 1.4 million servings of haddock chowder and this Provençal fish stew to food banks, including the Family Pantry of Cape Cod and the Greater Boston Food Bank. With a number of challenges on the horizon, such as climate change, supply chain issues, gentrification on Cape Cod, we've worked with Mass Division of Marine Fisheries, as well as Urban Harbors Institute at UMass Boston, and we created a 2021 port profile project. So this is just a screenshot from one of our reports, and this was the top 11 ports by landing. So this is data that was collected in 2018. I'll provide more updated information on the next slide, but Chatham was number three. Commercial fishing is an increasingly important part of our state's blue economy, and culture. It provides both part-time and full-time employment for thousands of residents, and it's really that critical link between commercial fishing and the local seafood we all enjoy. Surveys from fishermen and harbor masters indicate that despite many of our industry's successes, there's also many access and infrastructure challenges. 
Among the most frequently cited in the survey was the need for dredging, a lack of affordable moorings for commercial use, and the need for more space to load and unload catch or gear, and a lack of parking. As a result, town support is crucial and really important. And this port profile project will give decision makers as well as town officials the tools and the needs to be able to protect the fishing communities. Here's a screenshot from our report. Um, so again, these are on Mass Division and Marine Fisheries website. But here you can see Chatham is the third most valuable port. It will talk about the number of permitted vessels, how much money the fishermen receive during this type of work, but also how many pounds are landed. In 2021, Barnstable County seafood was close to 52 million pounds, so it's a huge number, bringing in about 74.5 million X vessel value, and that represents 9% of mass landings. New Bedford's about 80%. <laughs> Cape Cod supports many local fisheries as well, such as hook and line for spiny dogfish and for haddock, pot trap, so for lobster, Jonah crab, it's an emerging species, I highly recommend you eat it, uh, black sea bass, otter trawl for hake, for squid, for flounder and other ground fish, as well as scallop dredge, so it goes along the seafloor for Atlantic sea scallops, and gillnet that targets monkfish, winter skate, dogfish. We also have conch fishing and fish weir on Cape Cod. In addition, we empower fishermen to collect research and be a part of the process. So we have a scallop research set-aside program, it's called RSA with NOAA, and we're giving fishermen the tools to collect data on scallop growth and reproduction to track changes due to climate change. So we're really trying to understand, can these warming waters influence the timing of spawning? When scallops put more energy into spawning, they put less energy into meat yield. So those scallops that we love to enjoy might be smaller. <laughs> so this can impact our scallop growth and impact the fishery. So it's really important that we collect the data and we empower fishermen who are already out in the water to do so. As we've heard throughout yesterday and today, climate change is most often described as this global phenomenon, but it's really begun to affect people and the environments at a much more local and regional scale. The waters surrounding Cape Cod are some of the most productive in the world, but as these waters warm, concerns have been raised about how this will impact fisheries and the people who depend on it. As a result, there's an urgent need to collect better data to better understand this environment. Many fish and organisms are completely and very temperature dependent, so changing that temperature gradient even a few degrees can really impact their movement, their migration. Many marine species respond to warming in different ways. Some can shift north into deeper, cooler water, such as lobster. Others can increase in abundance and their range can expand, such as black sea bass or Jonah crab. And others can really restrict in abundance, as touched on Atlantic cod. And this figure is from the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. I'll talk a little bit more about the EMO program on the next slide. But the darker the color, the warmer the water, this is surface temperature, um, and the blue is about 56 degrees, um, so really it's showing these warm core rings or eddies that come off the continental shelf. And so I've done a lot of work in previous employment on marine heat waves that were discussed and kind of understanding that process off the Gulf Stream. So here is what I was referring to as EMOLT, or Environmental Monitoring on Lobster Traps. This is run by the Gulf of Maine Lobster Foundation in collaboration with the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. But this gives fishermen temperature depth instruments. So when they're out there on the water every day, they're able to collect information. And that information is automatically transferred via Bluetooth to a mini computer on the fisherman's dashboard. So they're able to view this temperature data, refine their fishing practices, and then scientists are able to get near real-time data. Um. By utilizing fishermen's time on the water and their knowledge of the ocean environment, we can develop a better understanding of this highly dynamic area. By working with fishermen, we all win. We can automatically get access to that data that can improve oceanographic models and work with, better with scientists. When you speak with fishermen, you learn right away how important it is that they are research partners and involved in the data collection process. Historically, there's been a big disconnect between the science and management community and fishermen. And often fishermen feel that no matter what they bring to the table, it always goes back to that dreaded A word, anecdotal. When fishermen are able to go out and collect data themselves, they feel empowered and they believe in that data. In addition, it strengthens the perception that working with the industry is still scientific data. Fishermen's experience, knowledge, and expertise on the water makes them an incredibly valuable resource for scientists and for the successful stewardship of our oceans. When fishermen are empowered to collect more data, it becomes more reliable and we have better 
track record with stock assessments, and therefore, fishermen can continue to stay on the water fishing, and we can feel confident eating our local seafood. Next, I'd like to touch on offshore wind that was discussed a bit yesterday. So here is a screenshot from the Northeast Ocean Data Portal. And what this is showing is vessel activity, commercial vessel activity, from 2015 through 2019. And the darker the color, the more fishing activity. So you can see it's a highly productive area. And it overlaps with offshore wind lease areas that were discussed yesterday. And kind of zooming in, we have Revolution, South Fork, Sunrise, Bay State, Park City, which is also part of Alvin Grid, Vineyard Wind One, Beacon, Mayflower, and Liberty. So you can see many companies are discussing leasing, but it's really cumulative and really up close and personal in our backyard. NOAA released last month uh, the Synthesis of Science report, and in there there's a quote that I just wanted to share, but the fishing industry is highly concerned with the quality of cumulative impacts currently being conducted for offshore development. The Bureau of Energy's current approach is to analyze projects on an individual basis. But the environmental and economic effects will not be isolated, and fishing communities have suggested that the scale of analysis should mat match that of fisheries and ecosystem management practices. In this report, they recommend that still an enormous amount of research needs to be done to understand offshore wind impacts. They discuss ecosystem effects, fisheries socioeconomics, and both the sociocultural effects, fisheries data collection, how our current research surveys will be impacted, methods and approaches, including addressing those cumulative impacts, as well as regional planning. As part of the siting, design, and permitting process for offshore wind, the Bureau of Energy Management and other states require developers to prepare various monitoring programs to characterize, evaluate, and monitor impacts, such as benthic habitat, fisheries, marine mammals and protected species, as well as fishing operations. By engaging the fishing industry, the data can improve the quali quality, credibility, transparency, and utility of that data. There are several sets of guidelines in place by the Bureau of Energy Management, by the Respos Responsible Offshore Science Alliance, or ROSA, the Responsible Offshore Development Alliance, or RODA, as well as other state and federal agencies. Many of the fishery monitoring surveys I've been involved in with developers requires that you do two years of baseline construction, two years during construction, and then two years post-construction. Many surveys are intended to provide baseline information on the seasonal distribution and abundance of local fish. To me, it's very important that each fishery is well represented to the developers, and there's an enormous value in scientific data collected. In summary, Climate change, as we know, is increasingly impacting our fisheries. There is a need to mitigate those climate impacts, and we know offshore wind is here in southern New England. However, impacts for offshore wind are uncertain. There will be changes to circulation and productivity. There could be impacts to birds, marine mammals, fish, and invertebrates. There will be lost fishing opportunities and revenue, gear loss, displaced effort, safety concerns navigating these wind turbines, and an impact to current existing federal fisheries surveys, such as the research vessel Henry B. Bigelow. A lot of our fisheries management involves establishing catch levels that are based on stock assessments. In the Northeast, a number of scientific surveys overlap with offshore wind development areas. For example, the Northeast Fisheries Science Center Bottom Trawl Survey. Offshore wind development will impact this survey and consequently the scientific and management results. Within offshore wind, survey operations will be curtailed or eliminated under this current vessel capacity limits, safety concerns, and assessment protocols. Without a clear plan to adapt these data collection programs, these programs will suffer from survey reduction in information, increased uncertainty in our stock assessments, and result in poorly informed management decisions. Given these concerns, I believe it's really important we consider alternative and new solutions such as engaging with the fishing industry and using perhaps smaller vessels that can maneuver within wind farm grids. Engaging the fishing industry improves the outcomes, and we have some of the best scientists in our region. So working collaboratively, we all win. Together, we're building a better future for fish and our fishing communities. Our fisheries support a strong economy, and they provide a healthy local source of food, Fishing and shell fishing are an integral part of Cape Cod's heritage, and these industries have facilitated the growth of our coastal communities. 
At the Fisherman's Alliance, we continue to advocate for healthy, vibrant fishing communities, strong working waterfronts, and resilient coastal communities. We are currently taking action now to protect both fish and fishermen by working towards promoting sustainable fishing practices, supporting those small boats by making sure they have a voice at the local, state, and federal level, engaging in fishermen-driven science so that we can have sensible and forward-looking regulations and management. We want to invest in fisheries to provide opportunities for today's fishermen, but also future generations, and make sure they can have a strong business. And we want to connect our community to commercial fishermen. It's a rich history. We want them to be aware of it, the current challenges they face, and create a connection to the local seafood on our plates. At the Fishermen's Alliance, we believe that fishermen possess the solutions to the challenges they face, whether it's improvement to fishing regulations, expanded research, or educational and economic opportunities. Our work is guided by the energy and expertise of the fishing community. Last year, we spent nearly 300 days at regulatory meetings, bringing fishermen's knowledge and expertise to the decision-making table. Our time navigating these policies allows fishermen to spend their valuable time on the water doing what they do best. As the policy manager at the Alliance, I will continue to work towards preserving and anchoring fishermen's access in our community and maintaining an effective and permanent voice on Cape Cod. After all, the commercial fishing is a crucial and vital part of our blue economy, and I hope you will continue to support them. With that, I just really would like to thank you for the opportunity today, and if you have other questions, please feel free to grab me. Thank you.